In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And with your spirit. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries. Lord Jesus, you raise us to new life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you forgive us our sins. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you feed us with your body and your blood. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You see what we just did? We took it for granted that our sins can be forgiven. That's because of what happened on Good Friday. Isn't that amazing? Our sins can be wiped away no matter what you've done. And we just kind of jump into it. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. O oh God, who on this day, through your only begotten Son, have conquered death and unlocked for us the path to eternity, grant, we pray, that we who keep the solemnity of the Lord's resurrection may, through the renewal brought by your Spirit, rise up in the light of life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God for ever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter proceeded to speak and said, you know what has happened all over Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. 
We are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. This man God raised on the third day and granted that he be visible, not to all people, but to us, the witnesses chosen by God in advance, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commissioned us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians. Brothers and sisters, if then you were raised with Christ, seek what is above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Think of what is above, not what is on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, your life, appears, then you too will appear with him in glory. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, Lord. 
On the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark, and she saw the stone removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, they have taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple went out and came to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. He bent down and saw the burial cloths there, but did not go in. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths there and the cloth that had covered his head, not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. Then the other disciple also went in, the one who had arrived at the tomb first, and he saw and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you. Good morning. I'm Father Thomas, uh, one of the Dominicans from St. Patrick's downtown Columbus. Uh, just pinch hitting. It's good to be here. The, um, there we go. There's a number of things going on in this, on these readings, and we're going to look at them over this next week. This, this next week is an octave. It's one of the last of the octaves in the church calendar. Um, we got rid of a lot of them, probably more than we should have, but this, we've retained this one. And so Easter Sunday is like extended over eight days. And the readings are just going to rehash and tease out some things. What would be an example of that? The, one of them would be Mary Magdalene. Uh, if you know anything about courts and witnesses, when you go and bring a witness in, let's say you're for the prosecution or the defense, you're going to bring a witness to testify in court, you've got to have someone that's credible. You wouldn't start out with someone who's guilty of uh, perjury, who's been found guilty of perjury many times. You would have a credible witness. Well, back in Roman times, especially this time 2,000 years ago, Roman and Jewish court, women were not credible witnesses. You are now. We love you. But back then, uh uh-uh. And so the first witness to the resurrection was Mary Magdalene's woman. It would get you laughed at. They would say, oh my golly, get out of here. So why, if you're going to make up a religion, why would you lead with a woman? You would lead with the high priest. You would lead with one of the officers of the king's court. You wouldn't lead with someone who'd get you tossed out, because that's what would happen, unless that's the way it happened. That's called the principle of embarrassment. You don't bring up, when you're going to make something up, you don't think, make things that would embarrass you. So just think of the apostles. Their unbelief constantly, their selfishness, their who's the greatest, it makes them look bad. You wouldn't bring that up if you're going to make something up. Yet they did. Imagine this. Imagine Andrew there with a little bit of pen and ink going, hey, Peter, why don't we have this Jesus guy say, get behind me, Satan, to you? Oh, that'll make people want to follow us. No, it won't, okay? It's going to make people say, he called you Satan? Get out of here. I'm not following you, unless that's what actually happened. Principle of embarrassment. We use it in courts all the time. Use it in the Gospels. And so Mary Magdalene leading would not have brought an applause. It would have brought mockery. The second thing is this this whole thing with the grave, the burial cloths, okay? In Jewish burial customs, and this is just the, like this is the, the commercial break before I actually get in the homily. We'll keep it short. We have all these bambinos here that are ready to sc- scream out, okay? Usually they scream like, preach longer, Father. Preach longer. <laughs> but over this week, they're going to be preaching, away with him, away with him. We want the other guy. And so I want to be done before they get cranked up, okay? But these burial claws, in Jewish first century burial custom, 
they, they still had a little bit of the Egyptian in them. They would wrap the person with cloths, bands, and then they would take aloes and myrrh. And aloes and myrrh was a slimy mixture. Herod had 80 pounds of aloes and myrrh. Think of a, how big of a bag of mulch is, okay? It's about 25 pounds. Well, Herod had 80 pounds of it. Jesus, says scripture, had 100 pounds. Do you see the wink Jesus has given us? Like, wink, wink, Jesus had 100 he was better than Herod, okay? That's kind of what it's saying. But they would take that and they'd s smear it all over the bandages and it would form a cast. You ever seen a plaster cast? That's what would happen. And they left this part of the body open. They did not cover up this part. It was separated. And they had what we would call a turban. It's a cloth that's twisted. So when it says, he saw the burial cloths there, and the cloth that covered his head and the burial cloth was rolled up in his, the actual word is twisted, okay? Like a turban. And so what's going on there? What John may have seen, remember John looked in and said, oh my golly, I believe. He saw the burial cloths and he came to believe in the resurrection. Why? He may have looked in, and this is just conjecture, but based on first century burial cloths and a hundred pounds of aloes and myrrh, he may have seen the cast that was still there, but since there was no body to hold it up, it was caved in. And he may have seen that. It wasn't torn up, because that would have been just a robber, right? A dumb robber, because you can sell burial claws. Why would you steal the body and first take off the burial wrappings? That doesn't make sense. So he may have seen that, and the, the part that was the, the turban twisted or rolled up separate from the burial claws separated by that much with a face covering. He may have seen that with no body. It caved in. Kind of like if you came down for Christmas and you saw all the gifts there that were there recently, all those gifts that are all wrapped up. If you saw them, all the gifts gone and the paper torn up, you'd call the cops, wouldn't you? That means it got, you got stolen. If you, if you came downstairs and you saw all the wrapping paper folded up nicely and the gift's gone, you'd still call the cops. You got a weird robber on your hand. That's weird. But if you came downstairs and you saw all the gifts just as it was, but the gifts were gone, but the wrapping paper was still in place and some of the big ones were caved in, you would probably call a priest, <laughs> okay? Like, ah, what happened here? It smacks of the supernatural. That's what they may have seen. They may have seen that. So, uh, but that's conjecture, but he saw something that made him believe. What's going on? A little bit of a story first. You know, in TV land, I've always been amazed when you look at a debate. You look at a debate between two people. There's a TV station that, remember Hannity and Combs? They had two different spectrums of the political spectrum, and they would get in a debate. One of them always drove me nuts, okay? Okay? And they would get in debate, and, they, and you'll hear this even today. They'll say, okay, you have the last word. Given, and they still do that today. You, you have the last word. You can finish it off. Now, that's a privileged position to have the last word, right? If someone has the last word in a debate, if you're in school and you get into debate class, the last word is the one you want. Why? Because you can counter all the arguments of the other team. Okay? You can counter all the arguments and they can't come back at you. You can give your audience, the judges, an image and that's the image that sticks with them, the last image. You can set the tone for the rest of the debate because you have the last word. That's a powerful place. And you can reflect on anything that was said before and give your mind on it. The last word is powerful. And so in our culture, there is a last word realize this. It is a last word, and it stops all effort. It stops all work. It stops anything that is good, this last word. And it can't be argued against. People don't like mentioning it, but it's the background behind our culture, especially if you are in high school or college, or you know someone in high school and college. This last word is operating, though no one likes to say it. 
It sets the tone for our life, and it reflects back on daily life. It's death. Death is the last word for many people. Annihilation. (sighs) You're gone. That's the last word for many people in our culture. We basically have what is, for all intents and purposes, an atheist culture. And death is the last thing for most people. It's the final thing. And and the thought that that's going to happen stretches back. If death, or if you just want to say the supernova of our sun, remember one day it's going to go to encompass our entire solar system, the supernova, and everything will be reduced to carbon, white ash. Go look at a bonfire. Have a great bonfire during Easter season and look at white ash and see what that's like. It's nothing. Everything, every monument, every project, every work of art is going to go to white ash. And so that's our future. And it stretches back and it starts to change what we're dealing with. Imagine if you had a shed, a shed in your backyard for keeping your lawn equipment. And you knew it was going to burn down in three weeks. Would you go, hey, we got to put new shelves in that shed. we got to put new shelves for oil and everything else. Let's put in the new shelves in that shed. Would you do that knowing that it's going to burn down in three weeks? Hey, I want you to spend a lot of time painting it. I want a good paint job on that. Paint it. If it's going to burn down in three weeks, no, you wouldn't. If you knew that your work was just going to be torn up and thrown out, You wouldn't work on it too much if you know that's going to happen. That's what death does in our culture. People don't like talking about it. They don't like thinking about it. But it has that power. It is the dirty secret of atheism. That everything is going to end in ashes. All your work. All your friendships. Everyone you love. Gone. Every project you work so hard at, no one's going to care within a couple generations because we're just going to die and there's going to be ashes, annihilation. That's the atheist mind, and it's behind what's going on a lot with our culture. It's behind the lack of hope. It's It's behind the despair that is grabbing our culture. It is the last word for many people. See if you can see it this week. Try to see that in the culture, this this last word of annihilation. But that's not God's plan. That is not God's plan. That's why we celebrate today. Death isn't the last word. Life in Jesus is. That's why we celebrate his victory over death. That's the last word. Life in Jesus, not death. God plans eternal life for every person in Jesus. He plans glory. You know, when you walk outside, don't look at the sun, but see the effects of the sun and how it makes everything look awesome. You, in Christ, are going to be brighter than any sun. You're going to make that sun look like a dim light bulb, like a a wonderful candle. that, That sun is only that bright spiritually. You're going to be brighter. That's God's plan for us. And therefore, during this life, every little thing you do is colored by the fact that one day you're going to show that to God and he's going to be awed by it. His sons and daughters, he's awed by every little word, every little kindness, every little chore you've done because you love him and the family he's given you. All of that is is earning for us an eternal weight of glory because of the resurrection, because of today. Other people are afraid of that stepping over called death, but we're not. We have to regain that. It can't hold us. It's like a defanged tiger. It's got no claws. It can smack you around. It looks good. It can go, but you can smack it, and it can't hold you. That's what death is for us because of Jesus. We will experience, those who are united to Jesus, we will experience everything he did. If you're going through a Good Friday moment, stay with the Lord. Easter Sunday is right around the corner. That's the promise of our faith. That's what our faith brings to our culture. We have a hope. Now, others may act like they have hope, but they can't explain why. Hear that? Thank you. Wrapping it up, okay? 
the more babies, the shorter the homily. Come on. Okay? That's what we, the, this day does for us. It brings the hope of eternal life. It starts in Jesus, and for everyone as a member of his body, we will experience it. As members of the body of Christ, as those who are in Jesus, what happens to him is going to happen to us. That is unique among world religions. That's not Confucianism. That's not Buddhism, Islam, or Judaism. It's none of those. It's unique to Jesus. We live in his body, his life now. And as he has experienced the resurrection, so shall we. We will conquer death. That's the promise of today. This week, as you go outside, take a deep breath as you leave because nature's incense is going on. It's like incense at mass, but it's nature producing this wonderful smell. I think it's only going to last a few days, but go out there and take a, a deep breath. You may have to get your Benadryl ready also, okay? But um, as you go out this week, look at nature coming back to life. You know, the colors, the faint colors of trees, uh, daffodils are coming out. Other uh, flowers are coming out. It's coming alive again after the seeming death of winter. That's a sign of our faith that in Jesus we too will come back to life. Because he has risen from the dead, we will also. Because we're joined to him through baptism. Life itself is the last word, not death. Life is the last word, and in Christ we are going to live forever. Jesus, the life of the world, he is the last word. Please stand. Today throughout the church, we are we are renewing our baptismal promises. We're renewing that sacrament by which we were joined to Jesus so that what he experienced on Easter Sunday is ours. And this is how it was done. And the form we're going to use are the baptismal promises that everyone here made, usually through some proxies, some people who stood in for you until you made it your own in confirmation. And so the author that came up with this was a guy named Hippolytus. He wrote it down. He was, he was dead by about the year... 230. This is pre nicene This is early, early faith. Listen to what it says. Dear brothers and sisters, through the Paschal mystery, that's basically passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the Paschal mystery, we have been buried with Christ in baptism so that we may walk with him in newness of life. And so now that our Lenten observance is concluded, let us renew the promises of holy baptism by which we once renounce Satan and his works and promise to serve God in the Holy Catholic Church. And so I ask you and respond with a hearty, I do. Do you renounce sin so as to live in the freedom of the children of God? I do. Do you renounce the lure of evil so that sin may have no mastery over you? Do you renounce Satan, the author and prince of sin? In the early church, they would do this at the Easter vigil. And it was a nine-hour service, okay? Nine hours. That was pre-coffee. That's pretty amazing, okay? That's real religion. And so they would do this, and at this moment, they would turn towards the rising sun, which in nature reminds us that Jesus, the son of the living God, is risen. It reminds us of that every day. And so, do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered death and was buried, 
rose again from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? And may Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given up new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, and bestowed on us forgiveness of our sins, keep us by his grace in Christ Jesus our Lord for eternal life. No pitching in the church league today. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, trusting in God's great love and mercy, we offer our needs and petitions. That our Holy Father, Pope Francis, will inspire renewed Easter faith and encourage Christ-based love for the poor of the world, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the leaders of nations ensure to every person the free exercise of religion, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the newly baptized and newly received continue their lifelong journey into the Paschal Mystery, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those crushed by addiction, depression, and grief rise to new life through the grace and mercy of Christ, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the living body of Christ gathered here nourish the spirits of those who have received the Easter sacraments, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. God, our Father, we thank you that you have risen your son Jesus and have given us the promise of the resurrection. Continue to hear our prayers, for we ask all that we need in the name of Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have the bread that we offer you, fruit of the earth and the work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have the wine that we offer you, fruit of the vine and the work of human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept sacrifice to your hands, the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the cause of the Church. Exultant with paschal gladness, O Lord, we offer the sacrifice by which your Church is wondrously reborn and nourished. Through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, at all times to acclaim you, O Lord, but on this day above all, to laud you yet more gloriously, when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. For he is the true Lamb who has taken away the sins of the world. By dying, he has destroyed our death, and by rising, restored our life. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people exults in your praise, and even the heavenly powers with the angelic host sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. <laughs> And all you have created rightfully gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, Graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, 
For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Mystery of faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth. With your servant, Francis our Pope, Earl our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory. Through Christ our Lord, to whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours. Forever and ever. the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord 
Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. Graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other a sign of peace. We believe that in the Eucharist, we come before the living Lord Jesus, the living Jesus who is glorified in heaven on the throne. Angels tremble before him, but we see him under the appearance of the sacrament. If he showed up in his power and glory, I know at least one person who might not have the courage to stick around here in the church and maybe flying outside because he's his power and glory itself. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord,
let's pray. Look upon your church, O God, with unfailing love and favor, so that, renewed by the Paschal Mysteries, she may come to the glory of the resurrection. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Only uh, one friendly announcement. Lent is 40 days. You Like the song says, these 40 days of Lent, O Lord. Easter season is 50. It's a week of weeks, okay? It, that's a neat way of putting it. It's a week of weeks until Pentecost. It's Easter season. We celebrate the resurrection. This next eight days in the church's mind is only one day. It's an octave. And so we celebrate the same prayers over and over again for one day. We're, we're teasing it out. We're going to look at it. If you can get to Mass and read the, the gospel readings in the first reading. And so what that means is Definitely for these eight days, but really for all 50 days, he is risen, you should rejoice in that, and calories don't count for 50 days. They really don't, okay? If they, you think they do, okay, let them, but we don't care because he's risen. So make sure that the resurrection and the joy of the resurrection show up on your dinner table every night, better yet, Dessert at breakfast, lunch, and dinner for at least eight days. And if you really want to go for it for 50 days, he is risen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Mass is ended. Go in peace. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. alleluia.